to get speakers lined up, get all the preparations made. Um, the deadline to register for the conference is next Monday. So if you haven't registered yet and would like to attend, we would invite you to go ahead and register soon just to make sure that we have a good planning in place. And so. Yes, I believe if you go to the same website as the registration, actually, let me see if I can pull that up really yep. quick. OK, we're going to pull that up and that way anyone who's following along online can navigate there too. Have those breakout sessions. That was. We'll try a different route. OK, and here's the conference. And so conference website is within the housing page and the information is here. Scroll down just a little bit. I'm trying to look to point out the registration link. OK, here's where we register. And then the speakers are listed here. We do now have four board members, so here in just a few moments, we'll officially get started on the record. But we're just doing a quick preview of the housing conference that's upcoming next Wednesday. And so we've got quite the slate of speakers, a lot of very familiar names, both within the local government world and the housing world. And so if you happen to be looking here or take a look at this video later on, then this is a list of our slate of speakers for the upcoming housing conference. So. With that, I'm going to switch back to the regular meeting and back to the beginning of the PowerPoint presentation. OK, here we go. And so I believe that we are officially ready to begin. We're going to call the meeting to order. And uh, first thing on the agenda is uh, the approval of the March 8th Minutes. Everybody has a chance to review the minutes. If so, I would accept a motion to approve the minutes. Well, thank you. Uh, second. Okay, let's go ahead and move to the Sedgwick County tax sale updates. Okay, so this month um, we continue to see redemptions come in. As a staff, we do monitor um, daily what's going on in terms of the Cedric County tax sale filings and redemptions that have come through. I believe when I counted, we are actually seeing 24 redeemed properties since last meeting. So that's ultimately a good thing. Um, of the properties that are still not redeemed, I believe we started with 20 within our established focus area, and we still have 16 that are still um, in line to be sold in the tax foreclosure sale, if not redeemed. And so um, our staff continues to monitor that. We can also engage in another round of outreach efforts to see if there would be any additional interest at this point in time in those properties being donated or contributed to the land bank. Um, at this point, the last we've heard is that sale is anticipated to take place in late summer or early fall. And we will continue to monitor and update once we have more um, clarity and what date that is. And so another task that the board had given us was to continue to assess particular areas of vacant parts or properties within our focus area. Last month we reported on a such section within our north mile and this month staff have reviewed a section within our south mile of the focus area. And so this review focuses on the area between Grove and Hillside and 12th and 13th Streets. And I'm going to let Roger share just what staff have observed in that area. Last I took the photographs though, a couple of weeks ago, we finished the evaluation sheets. It has some of the same issues that the north section has, you know, maybe code enforcement, abandoned cars. Uh, there are adjacent owners to some of those vacant lots. Uh, Rock the Block is heavily involved in that area. You can see, I believe, in the red. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, yeah, right there. So, a lot of good development there. 
And so I think a lot of the board's desire in asking us to look at these parcels is to understand what's already there and how we can really target efforts to intensify redevelopment in places where it's already occurring to have more of a, a deliberate approach instead of a scattershot approach. So the blue is vacant lots, right? Yes. Just to refresh. And then the red is, is new construction. Um, our understanding when this map was created was that blue was truly vacant and red was that some activity might be occurring. Okay. Um, the maps, the original red and blue map was created, I believe, in 2022, early in the year. And so some of these where we see red are now completed homes. Um, you can see the overlap between the two maps where the green dots represent um, builds that we know of that have been completed through nonprofit partners. Um, so there's there's about a year difference between these two maps, but the red is some activity observed. Vacant, is that vacant lots or is that vacant house? Lots. Any concentration of ownership or did you look at the ownership? Uh, in the north section, there are uh, multiple lots that are owned by one or two individuals. Uh, that are also corporate owned. So those are probably you know, investment properties that are fully owned. So a second sweep in these areas could also look at um, presumptively vacant properties or properties that are experiencing distress or other problems. But this first focus has been on vacant lots only. Any other questions or details at this time? You know, when we say it's corporate owned, um, we assume that they're going to be building on it. I mean, how much is this corporate actually built out here? Is it very often oh, construction hard to believe you can build a house and be able to rent it? Um, so are we making that assumption? Yes, I am. That they would build on it, but yeah. how many have how many corporate is actually built on it out there? That I could tell you. That's so it might be worth your while to check to see because. Um, you know, if they're not maintaining it well, if we start making them take care of it, now all of a sudden it starts to be a liability that they're just hanging on to it for whatever reason. Um, and maybe they are very viable to get sold. So I, I might, um, I mean, don't you think it's pretty hard to build something in this marketplace and have it brand new and make it? Well, I mean, just to, it'd have to be multifamily. It couldn't just be a single family house, obviously. Yeah, most of those are single. You know, so it'd have to be a we have to gather up there, but it had to be a, a duplex. So it's be about it's about two two well, twenty. Most of the stuff is two hundred twenty thousand to put up a duplex. Well, most of that that's being built though is probably habitat or yeah. housing. Where they're getting deep subsidies. They're getting subsidies. Yeah, we have a way to track like the habitat homes of the newer ones in the area so that there would be some comps to sustain the new development for those lots to get developers to be interested or investors interested in. They're definitely seeing an uptick in the appraised values in these areas in my discussions with, with habitat in particular, um, especially over the last year. Which which can help. It's still not anywhere near making it cash flow for a single family rental, or even as, even in a home ownership situation, costing more to build than they could get at their own price. I think that's why we were looking at that deal for the housing conference. We were talking about the remember we were talking about with the they were changing the thing from rural to urban for the development. The rural housing incentive district. Yeah. There'll be a so, whole presentation on that for Gilmore and Bell. Yeah, so that would probably help out tremendously for something like this. That would cut a lot of the lot of costs down. I could also, when you talk to corp, if it's corporate owned or company owned, um, you know, if they contributed it to Habitat for Humanity or something, they could get write offs on it. Um, so that would be another avenue that would help. And to the land make, wouldn't it? Going to have to kind of serve as a brokerage between yeah. the 
vacant lot in Habitat or Mennonite Housing? I guess I still, I mean, I've driven through this area a lot trying to, to get an idea of what could do to help promote development in this area. And I really feel like it's important we sit down with the homeowners at some point and say, what, what are you looking for? You know, what, what would you like to see as far as development? And then dig a little deeper into the vacant lots, see how many of the vacant lots or title issues or, you know, what, what's the deal? And look at the lots that the city's put money into already and see where where's the cost, how much does it cost us? And then maybe, I mean, I'd love for staff to come up with an idea or plan saying, you know, Here's some things I think we need to do to move forward in this area. Just a challenge to you. I would even say with these being several smaller lots, as you they look very narrow, uh, there's going to be limited. You're know, looking at more so like tiny homes or and then I, I agree with the community engagement aspect because. I've seen more interest from investors wanting to do uh, the shipping container homes, which again, the city is still trying to put together their requirements and code and that. But to me, I think that, you know, smaller homes for those lots, it would help also uh, with the financial aspect because it was a, it's more affordable to to build as opposed to a small home for an investor. So something to consider to get these lots filled. For the width of these lots. No, but some are not built. Some are 12 feet. Yeah, I mean, some of those larger lots on 13th Street, like they belong to the city. Yeah. yeah. No, I know that, for example, this was in the north section that we looked at last time. This lot here was not buildable. This one is landlocked. We know that there are some that are certainly that way. Most are probably a little bit more standard size than that, but still not necessarily your modern construction style on the long and narrow lots. But all the other house lots that are small like that have houses on them. They are on multiple lots. Single lots. They're on single lots. So it's buildable. Most of them. Most, Most of them. Reasons for not being built. But like she was saying, land lots are landlocked. So it has no street access. You have a lot that's actually landlocked. There's no street access. Okay. So, like, yeah. Somebody need it. Yes. Yeah. Well, the flooding off. <laughs> uh, sometimes you get remnant parcels. Like they were building out a particular block or neighborhood, and it leaves a strip that's you know 20 feet wide. Well, what are you going to do with that? I you hope it's somebody's side yard. <laughs> yeah. Right. Side yard bigger. <laughs> well, uh, Blue ones that I can see, they're all built. Most of them should be. Um, for example, I know that this one here, this red one, is on the upcoming tax sale. And we're like, I don't know if we even want to send notice to that owner because that's not one that the land bank could reasonably do much with, with it being landlocked. And then I believe this property is a rental or a rental and investor owned property. And so we do want to at least at the moment of development is a key goal, be cautious on, you know, ultimate buildability. Something like that, you just contact that owner and put you in, try to sell it to them. So it's a rental, so they don't want the extra land to have to maintain. It's not going to increase their rent values. So they have no interest in taking. We need to put three tiny houses. Yeah. <laughs> the opportunity with that one would be that these are vacant right in front of it, but. Yeah. had communication. I mean, I wouldn't want to slow down the process of waiting to meet with the people. But I think um, I mean, their ones are going to want to be a safe neighborhood that's clean, wouldn't it? Um, I'm sure they'd like to have parks and that type of stuff. But I don't know if she had a bigger parcel. Um, but to keep it clean and so I think that can be pushed on to the vacant lot owners that they've got to start maintaining those. At a higher level, let's raise the bar. And maybe, maybe you guys are. Maybe it's you're being kept mowed pretty good and junks off of it and everything. But if not, let's start putting the pressure on the 
making them help pick up the neighborhood. There, there's a lot of properties in this area that do not show the pride of you that you would want to have yeah. if you were in a neighborhood. And, 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 and there's some houses that show a great pride of ownership, and it, you just feel sorry for them because they're fighting an uphill battle. So if there's a way that we could get the homeowner association or the neighbors to say, we have this expectation, and then if we can figure out a way to help them achieve that, and whether it's volunteering to go do a cleanup on a weekend for the trash and some of the stuff out of the neighborhood by providing a dumpster, that's opportunities I see might work, but I don't, you know, again, it's going to be the neighborhood that says, this is what we want done. I, I don't feel like we could just go in and say, here, here's a dumpster, clean it up. And those will be the focus of some of our community conversations to try to determine neighborhood by neighborhood, how much intervention, how much participation do they want? Because if we find that a neighborhood really values safe freedom and property rights above that redevelopment, we may choose that other areas are easier or more able to be worked within. And so the only way to do that is by conversation. And I'll share here in a little bit about some of the conversations already. So um, let's see, we also have continued working Let's see, um, with our Exhibit A and D documents that we shared about, we have done some rundown and analysis of the Exhibit Ds, which are the tax sale outcomes. Uh, so we can see which properties sold for what price and how much was recouped by local governments, whether properties sold for more or less than was what was owed. Um, and we have started work on our Exhibit A's. We ended up farming that out within our department to several different people to participate. Um, exhibit A's are going to be the filings that indicate all of the properties that were filed within a tax sale, including those that were redeemed. And so our hope in analyzing this is to really get a sense of which parcels show up in tax sale over and over and over, or which ones might be redeemed, or the ones that might be sold, purchased by an investor who doesn't develop it, um, cycles through tax sale four, five, six years later. So we're working with a 10-year sample of several hundred cases per filing. So it's going to still take some time to build, but we do have staff deployed to build that out. And I think once we get the database built, we're going to have some really interesting stories that we can lift out of it and understand more of particular properties, um, even some of these investor-owned vacant parcels, to understand have they been through tax sale? Have they just been sitting vacant, owned by a same investor? Have they been purchased recently? So, the idea of time frame on when that information may be available? At this point, I would say probably end of this quarter at the earliest. Um, I'm, a lot of these filings have about four, 450 cases per filing, and some years have multiple filings over 10 years. So it's a pretty big project to get it all rebuilt into a way that it's usable. It would be very important data, though, to have. Very much. Okay, and then um, first I want to thank Chairman Schmidt for attending City Council yesterday. We did present two items to Council, um, our 2022 annual report and a proposed acquisition for the 9th and Ash properties. And I, it's been a really busy five weeks since we last met with the development of both of those agenda items. I know I've had individual conversations with several of you about just next steps, thoughts, direction, to really try to get a sense of um, how to proceed on some of these issues. And so I did want to give a quick recap on both reports. Um, as far as the annual report, the board had asked us to really lift up two challenges to council in addition to successes from 2022. And so we talked about the locating of the land bank within this department. We talked about the identification of focus areas. Um, we talked about participation in watching the tax sale and better understanding that. And then we also lifted up the challenges that we're running into participating in tax sale as other land banks do in the state. Um, and I think tech, or the council was very receptive from what I could read. Not a lot of questions on that specifically. We also discussed our funding source of community development block grants and some of the opportunities to really leverage outside resources for local redevelopment 
but then also the challenges of having to make sure that every project is eligible and will have an eligible outcome before we touch the funding source. And I think, again, council seemed receptive. There were a few questions about potential opportunities there. Um, following the presentation, we had a council member who asked a couple of questions regarding opportunities to acquire out of probate and also whether we could work with people where there are titles that are challenging. And Sally was able to jump in and share a little bit about a pilot that she's working on there. So I've been having some conversations with Kansas Legal Services to try and pilot a small program to assist folks that are having probate or title issues. Um, kind of identifying that the funding for housing stability, which really came from emergency rental assistance, um, we can use the administrative funding to pilot a project to see what kind of results we get from that. So um, it's a little pot of money. We'll see how many families they could possibly help um, get resolution with their title issues so that either they can avoid a demo, like some of the problems we've heard and seen with, with projects that are being taken to council for condemnation and possible demolition. Sometimes those families have been trying to raise the capital to make repairs, but couldn't because of title issues. Or same thing with properties that might be in the tax foreclosure is trying to raise funding to be able to pay off those delinquent taxes so that the you know they don't necessarily lose the property simply because they have title issues. We're working on an MOU. We're hoping to pilot something, see how it goes. It come into play. That's what we're doing. And then one of the council members also had an initial question about a possible alternate funding source for supplementing the CDBG funding. And so at least that issue has been raised and there is active thought about what we can or what we can't do going forward. You all have any questions on the annual report? We did a good job. Thank you. Thank Very you. Good. And then our second one we said was the ninth and average properties. Um, and potential acquisition of those properties. And so we went ahead and um, began engaging in some community conversation at the prompting of board members in between now and the acquisition. Um, but we did um, we did take that forward yesterday and presented just the opportunities with those properties. We presented that they had been acquired by the city and demolition conducted with CDBG funds. And so they necessitate a CDBG eligible outcome. And ultimately, we didn't have any questions from the council on that. And it was approved. The acquisition by the land bank was approved 7 to 0. And so we are now in possession of our first two properties. Hey. Then what are you going to do with it? We're going to mow them. <laughs> <laughs> And so internally, we will be working on the logistical aspects of mowing and monitoring for dumping and some of the challenges. And I really appreciated when I did one-on-one -on -one conversations with board members, I appreciated all the questions that were raised and that opportunity to really make sure that we didn't have anything else that we needed to check boxes or things before we move forward on that. Um, so at this point, all the maintenance fees for those properties do transfer to us. Um, I also did want to let you know that I reached out to some of our nonprofit developers that we work with regularly, and I can say there is definitely active interest in the properties. And so what that interest would look like might depend on which developers we get proposals from, but I think there could be lots of opportunities there. Um, at this point, we haven't yet, but we can certainly build a list of people who would be interested within in receiving notices of properties available. And so the nice thing having a property now in our inventory, it forces those questions. It forces the how do we notify people when there are properties acquired? Um, we'll be building out places on the website that list the properties. So a lot of new applied learning that we get to embark on. Pretty robust listing of developers right now. People who have expressed interest in staying up to date on repositioning of public housing, as well as the affordable housing fund. And so I think that would be a good place to 
um, start. Is there a process that that has to be done with this, or I mean, is it a if Ben and I house and said yes, we have somebody that wants to have ownership and uh, get it done. City council has to. City has to. Yeah. <coughs> we just we just take a proposal council meeting and say we got this. I mean, just one lot. One lot we can get it done and sold and bond to the next. Well, this one's a little more complicated because the two lots combined are uh, could be substantial and have higher density than a single. If this was a single family home. It's kind of a slam dunk, right? You're not going to go to a neighborhood and say, hey, there was once a, a single family home on this lot and now it's big, it's been demolished and we want to build a single family home. That's really no impact to a neighborhood, right? Unlike this could be. And so that's why the discussions about having the conversations with the neighborhood. What, what do they want to? We happen here. Um, had some preliminary discussions. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, I'm actually, that's my next slide. <laughs> so I wanted to share a pretty thorough review of the initial conversations. And again, I really appreciated Kay lifting up at our last meeting that reminder that, hey, we've been doing a lot of behind the scenes work here. But as we get ready to activate, it is so important to be in the communities understanding their wishes and their desires rather than just having this be things that the city comes in and does um, because so many of those efforts can create tension they can fall flat um, so at that prompting i went ahead and reached out to some different stakeholders and entities that had been suggested i was successful at getting onto the district one um, district advisory board agenda last monday and we were able to give kind of a program overview and update with a mention that we were looking at acquisition of these two properties. And so that presentation really focused on um, how we'd selected a focus area within that district, um, some of the priorities of the land bank, the types of acquisitions, and our plans for community engagement. Um, and that engagement, as I outlined it at the meeting, I said we have plans to engage in general conversation with community stakeholders, um, as well as developers, because a lot of what we really can be is a conduit between those two entities. Um, it's my hope that we will go forward with open and intentional conversations. Um, and then I think that helps allow us a better understanding of what sorts of outcomes would be preferred when properties are acquired. And so from there, looking at my notes, some of the comments that we received back um, or that MACD has a social worker that assists with some preliminary conversation. And so that might be a connection that we could make with that social worker. Um, there was a suggestion that city staff should get out and do door knocking efforts. And I think that is the intention of our conversation. We need to moderate out just staff time and um, how much staff can do, how much the neighborhood can carry it forward for us too. But we certainly want our faces and our names and our contact information to be out there as people that can be called and contacted. There were a couple of suggestions about just land bank opportunities people have seen in other communities. Um, I will say this DAB was very well researched. They've done their homework and had really good questions. Um, one individual looked um, suggested using kind of an asset anchor model where you take an institution in the community that's really uh, an anchor or a linchpin in that community and develop around it. Um, specifically, the Dunbar area was suggested to say there's already work going on and could we really focus on houses around that area? Um, that model would take a little bit more research into how to use it with real estate. I'm more familiar with it in terms of um, programs and development um, of like educational opportunities than real estate. So but every suggestion has possibilities. Um, one individual did mention that as an organization, they had reached out about the same set of properties and for a potential kind of community benefit organization. Now, as he discussed further, because I was like, oh, no, <laughs> as he discussed further, he's, it sounds like that conversation was possibly pre-COVID. And so it's been a few years ago and um, truly just our acquisition doesn't change anything in terms of community benefit possibilities. 
So um, I hope to reach back out to him and find out more about what he has in mind, because I think we can consider all options as we go forward. And one individual mentioned trying to avoid gentrification, which always a concern with redevelopment. And um, somebody had mentioned like an adopt the block initiative with a stipend to help with upkeep so that it might be on the neighborhood with a stipend rather than on mowing crews. And so that options to consider. And then the final one that I think is very reasonable is that as we have acquisitions or movement of property, they would like a written report in the DAB agenda, just keeping them notified. And as we have strategic opportunities to come back and present. And so like Sally said, if we have, it was single family, we're looking at single family again, we probably won't deploy staff for intention, intensive community engagement on those because it's presumptive, but any, any strategic opportunities, that's gonna be important. And then Thursday, I was able to do coffee and conversation with the presidents of the A. Price Woodard and Murdoch Neighborhood Associations. Um, those are, um, this property is in A. Price Woodard, but then Murdoch meets with them and it's just on the other side of the street. So I felt like this was a really strategic opportunity to first build trust and then also to listen. Um, and so they had some really good feedback on what they see as potentially beneficial in those neighborhoods. And A. Price Woodard also is our south mile of our tar or our focus area. So um, generally they said housing would very much be viewed as a positive use in the neighborhood. Um, they mentioned especially single family homes, but even up to quad sized units, particularly if they're units that allow seniors to stay in their neighborhood or individuals with disabilities to be stably housed in well-built and affordable units. So no issue with multifamily um, on a lower scale. Um, when I then they asked about density ratings, and I said, you know, we've done analysis of maximum residential density, and it would be up to 18 units per acre. And they were not in favor of that. That was not going to be palatable. Um, as an entity, we have to make choices about what are best for community, um, the wider community when we make development decisions, but I think it's also important to know what the community would value and what they want it in those regards. Um, one thing that did come up as potentially advantageous would be mixed use development in which there is a residential space on top, commercial space below sort of development, um, especially if it was community benefit, things like grocery stores or Salons, barbershops, small business, things like that. And so, you know, this this is where I'm still fairly new here. I don't know what all we can and can't do within that space, but it's a great opportunity to explore and learn. Um, they really appreciated understanding the deed restrictions that come with land bank activity. Um, some of the things that our deeds automatically exclude, both the city and the land bank, are also things that they very much would not want to see in their neighborhoods. And at this point in time, both said that their neighborhoods are pretty robust with parks and community centers, so those would not necessarily be seen as needs. And so actually, after that conversation, I typed these notes up, emailed them back out to the individuals I spoke with. Um, one of my commitments is very much to build that strong cycle of trust to make sure that I am not mishearing and then misreporting what somebody said, but to make sure that Trust is built through active communication. And so I've also been in communication with both through the council agenda process or from the publication of the council agenda. And so that's that's a personal ethic that I bring, but I think will be very important to building trust as we go forward. And so some of our future plans involve additional neighborhood conversations with stakeholders, um, continued conversations, not only with those individuals we've been pointed toward, but also the next round of individuals that they point toward. And eventually the community carries that conversation after we've done strategic conversations to begin. Um, it's also my plan for us to begin with District 1, but then to begin some of this early conversation with other districts because eventually we may have opportunities there and I don't want to come in behind the game on those. And again, I like to take detailed notes. That's my journalism background speaking. 
but then cycle back to confirm and really initiate proactive conversation with stakeholders. And so I was going to ask if you all have any other individuals you would recommend us toward or other suggestions within that community engagement. The information, then we'll see what we got. Okay, will do. Was there a neighborhood association for that Ninth and Ash area? Is that yes. With mm -hmm. okay, and that's the beach funding. So, they do they actually do they specifically engage with their the community to kind of carry on the message that you've not yet. Um, I guess that's another one of the next steps that we do have planned is that we are on their April and May agendas for their upcoming neighborhood association meetings. The April agenda will be a brief update to let people know that we have acquired these properties and we're going to be engaging in community engagement now. And I guess with community engagement, I also wanted to specify that I see two levels with it. I see that we really have this broad conversation that we should be starting um, throughout the city step by step to understand or to say the land bank is activating. There are the things that we could do. And then there's the property specific conversation, which is really most appropriate between acquisition and disposition. Um, it, it's really not appropriate for us to go out before and talk about properties before we're the owner. But I think especially on these strategic ones, we may do our due diligence, assess interest, but want to make sure that we've got that neighborhood step in between. And so repeat the name of the neighborhood association for that particular. Yes, it's the A, just the letter A, Price Woodard. And I believe that one is 9th Street North, and it actually encompasses our South Mile. Um, so all of this mile is part of A, Price Woodard, and then it goes to the west a little ways along 9th Street and North. And then the, they meet with Murdoch, which is the mile to the south. Just to refresh, what was the actual size of the ninth and ash lot? Do you recall that information? Let me see if I have I, that right in front of me. I'm trying to remember, I didn't have the notes from last week of how many yeah. units that we've discussed could potentially. That's that's what I was thinking. I was looking to see if I had an exact. But yes, if we vacate the um, alley that separates the three properties, it would be about twenty thousand. And they, they said that they were not excited about multi-family. That's specifically dense apartments. So I think they, they actually brought up, I tried to leave it open-ended, and they brought up quads, kind of as what they would see as a maximum benefit. Only well, we put so many in a 20,000 square foot building yeah. anyway. To be able to fund 18 units, because you got to have one to have parking spots per unit. On the parking. So. <laughs> I have garages built. <laughs> A lot of ways to do so. And you have to put a sprinkler system on it for 18 right. units. So I'm thinking, like, if they have a garage. Well, Lex, you don't have to. Oh, good. Good information. Yeah. Okay, and then the other part I wanted to discuss on community engagement. Um, I had hoped to have some marketing materials to share with y'all today. And if you look okay. through your agenda, there is a flyer document that our communications team has designed. This was an early concept, and as a staff, we've looked. We generally like the design, although it did print a little bit more pink than it shows up on the screen. But we're thinking about revamping some of the text strategy here. And the thought there is really that this is written at a fairly high and governmental level. Um, we have words like deemed, underutilized. And so what we want to do is to make sure that we understand the audience that we're writing to. And one of the things Lance had done some research and looking at other materials and found a lot of places really focus on you know, do you have a property that's waiting you down? Do you have a property that 
you owe more on worth to you or that you're struggling to maintain. And so we're going to change some of our text to really reflect a more strategic outreach um, to understand you know, what is the benefit for somebody to donate to the land bank. And so some of the, like, I guess, phrases that we're looking at initially include things like transform your block, assist with challenging properties, make your neighborhood a better place. Um, we want that to be accessible language. There are places I think we have multiple words for transfer that we can simplify simply to transfer. Uh, we don't want to necessarily say sell or donate because we want to leave it open to multiple paths of transfer. Um, I think we can change it to vacant, neglected, or challenging properties instead of deemed underutilized. And so really want to focus on the owner and the neighbors rather than just something that kind of the city comes down and says, well, your property has been deemed underutilized. And so, and so that's, that's the strategy that we're looking at. And so also we're looking at doing a trifold piece that would be fairly evergreen. We don't want to be reprinting all the time and looking at kind of what situations would make somebody want to transfer property to the land bank. Um, what do they need to know about how that works? What can the land bank do with that property? And then a section for developers to understand what does it look like to potentially acquire and develop a property out of the land bank. So hoping that it will be a fairly helpful piece that can be kind of a one-stop shop. And so with that, I wanted to get your ideas on specific things that we should include. Should we post it like on our city website or are we planning to spell them out? Or yeah, it would be on the website. I think we're looking at the, the print materials also within our district um, neighborhood resource centers, um, things that could be dropped at probate, courts, um, estate planning, different uh, funeral homes. I mean, any sort of place where somebody might find themselves in possession of a challenging property and see this as a resource. And then also we'll have online materials to match. I think it's the angle of how do we help you improve your neighborhood? How do we help you with unwanted properties? You know, how do we help you challenging situations? I think it's all very, very good marketing tactic. And Lance did a really good job finding some examples that started us down that track. What percent of the ownership is private versus rental? Is it a, you have a good a good feel of what the market is as far as ownership out there? I don't know that we do. I'm looking to see if Sally does. But. I think that would be a place to start because how you market it would be different. Resident ownership or if it's company owned. So your strategy is going to be just driving through, it seems like 25% is owner occupied, 25% is rental, and then 50% is vacant. That vacant is that lots and that who owns those is just most of those would be, uh, I think, absentee owners or rental properties that need so much work they aren't getting rid of. So I'd, I'd call them absentee owners. Or next door. Marketing is really trying to keep that and find out who owns it. Yep. If you're going to market, you got to know who who you're marketing to. Out of out of the 44 units or vacant lots that I looked at <clears throat> up in the north area, adjacent. I'm sorry, what? Kind adjacent owners. Owners. So there's and those adjacent owners are they owner? Occupied or is it? I believe you could probably tell by how well they kept the vacant lot. I mean, they're fenced, mowed. Most of them look like they're occupied by the yeah. owner. Yeah. So I think I think they buy the lot, so they have the lot, they control it. But a lot of them have put vehicles that don't run anymore, added six foot fencing in there that 
really didn't add anything to the paper. Correct. Most of the time, if their tax statements go into the house, yeah, you, could, you could tell if it's a different address. That usually, they don't live yeah. there. Right. That's how you can tell usually if they don't. It's a rental normally. I'd say probably 75% go to a different house. Of the lots. Yeah, of the vacant lots. Well, most of them aren't owners next to them. So, I mean, I guess it gets back to market. You have to find out how you market too. That's going to really determine how you market. So, yeah, there's Park City, there's Texas, uh, Texas. Hayesville, just spread out. And what you do is you look at the ownership, you look at the like of taxes. You say that determines how you educate. We will dig into really trying to envision the end recipient of the materials. And also, as we have some concepts and drafts, we'll send those back out to you all for review and additional feedback. I want to make sure that we'd, we'd like to have it done by the May meeting that we go to the A. Price Woodard and Murdoch Neighborhood Association. But we also want to make sure that what we're preparing is well thought through and really well done for the longevity um, and really takes into account the end recipient. So once you get the information, even just a spreadsheet, send that out to the board members. Let us review that. And then if we have any. You know, Sarah, I think you made a point that you really appreciated some of the conversations you had with board members one on one. I think that would be a great place to start and expand that conversation, give you additional ideas on how do we help move this forward. Sounds good. And so you're wanting to see the spreadsheet of the vacant lots as we're developing with. I think all that information would be good. We can do that. Just so we understand what we're dealing with and, you know, Jerome, Marvin, I mean, they, they do this every day, so we might have some other ideas of how we approach it. Absolutely. And that's so helpful for us as staff because we can get deep in the weeds of the details and really it's coming back to you all and reporting back out and receiving ideas that propel us forward into the next steps. It's going to be our first attempt to kind of reach people on a macro level. The land bank. Since the project has been headquartered here, I think there was quite a bit of macro level engagement with the places for people comprehensive plan. Um, several conversations that I've looked back and seen online recordings, but this is the first really effort that we've had since the project has been an active and progressing project. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Your plan is to send mailers out to them once you identify what the marketing material language will be. Is that what you're saying? Are you going to start off with initially phone call conversations to? Um, I think phone calls may be a little more challenging just to get to the phone numbers. So these would be materials that could be sent to um, like people who are in the tax foreclosure sale, people who have vacant lots. Um, I think probably within that we could invite them to call us. It's just a little bit more difficult to track down that that contact for phone initially. I was thinking with side, a little easier to find those business the entities searching that. And Actually, it's more challenging than you think. Many of them are owned by LLCs that not publicize very easily the numbers that they have and the registries don't actually go. Those can be actually be more challenging. So even the Secretary of State, yeah. sir, they don't have any contact. If you can't just go there. You can call the numbers that are are in those listings, and and they don't. There, oftentimes, there's multiple LLCs associated with one group, and to try to dig through who is the real entities associated with an LLC is challenging. They have addresses. They have that usually a PO box. <laughs> I would send a certified letter. Yeah, well, that's why we do usually end up sending letters. Yeah, I was just asking because it, it costs its cost to cost associated with that is a lot higher, but I mean, more efficient, efficient to do that as opposed to the call. But I was just trying to see if we can avoid spending so much money on mail that would just be wasted. 
And we can also try email routes. I mean, any places that we can locate email addresses for. Again, it may be info at, but at least it's an early effort. And the more that we can get the word out, um, even just a few indications of interest can begin to really get things spinning. I'd encourage you to hit that low lying fruit and forget about the LLCs for right now and hit that stuff that's doable and work your way up once you get because uh, it can be very frustrating trying to find them. LLCs. The question I have is uh, have you ever tried to utilize this new, the AI uh, of chat GPT to help with? Gathering data and trying to expedite the uh, process by using this technology that everybody's buzzing about. I've not used it. I've, I've honestly just played with it. <laughs> <laughs> I've not used it in a business context. No. You know, I have some concepts in my mind, especially with all the different programs within our section of some builds that we can invite our tech team to assist us with. So that's a question we could ask them is you know, what's out there, but I think we would really need them to coach us on how to use it effectively. <laughs> I, I am hoping eventually to cross-reference some of these databases that we're building here with some of our home repair databases and others that we have in our department to, you know, dig deeper. And I'm a storyteller by, by training, and so the more that I can identify and lift up stories, I feel like that helps us understand what we're looking at. Um, but AI is not something that we had really delved into yet. It's to help expedite the process, especially with all the data you're spewing out to your departments and you're already limited with personnel. So uh, bring that up as a consideration. Okay. Let's see. Um, so moving on to our next and final item. Um, is there any other business or items for open discussion today? Just so I understand the properties we acquired. Those. The land bank, right? Yes. Now. What? I think what's the next step? What are we doing? Are we trying to market it, sell it? What are we? What are we doing? We're we looking for a developer. That's exclusively what we're looking for. We're looking for someone to develop, and give a specific thing that they're going to put there. Or are we looking just to straight out sell the land and get it out of our? I know? think really we're looking for a development strategy. And we're looking at community interest in that stewardship to development. So probably we haven't really stopped and said, well, now what? Other than I, I know that we need to mow. <laughs> making sure that that doesn't slip off our radar. And initially that mowing plan is that we already have a contract for mowing of our vacant public housing units. And so we would work to add that to the contract, although the billing would continue to take place separately for land bank lots. Um, but yeah, I think as far as, you know, marketing the property, the acquisition of a property allows us first to test, um, we've got a quick claim deed in process that will bring the property to us. Um, and then really start to build out, you know, how do we post this on our website? Which developers do we reach out to? I think we would probably want to reach out and notify the developers that I've reached out to for pre-assessment, for sure, and let them know. Um, and then we'll need to determine potentially staff recommendations back to the board. What sort of timeline do we want to be on? Do we want to try to move the property fairly quickly or... What is a reasonable time to get development proposals? Because I think there is definitely a goal for the board from the conversations I've had not to let properties linger within the land bank, not to take on extra maintenance costs just because. Well, I think our plans to get rid of it as soon as possible. I think that it'd probably be good to come up with an RFP or an RFQ uh, just to say, here's sort of the parameters of what our expectations are. This has to be, I mean, that property that we are acquiring has to be residential. It has to be multifamily, somewhere more than two units on the lots, if not four or eight. And I think we just want to have a proposal as to what would you do as a developer? What would you propose? How would it look? And what would the... Definitely need to start at end time. We don't want it and the depth, you know, sitting there yeah, for the next five years and nothing happens. It'd be a start, you know, an overall plan of 
from the time you acquire to the time it's complete, what's it look like and what are you willing to pay for? Well, um, and the challenge with that though too is this particular one, there's gonna we need to do some more community engagement. It was a single family home that was on a single family home. I'd go and let's get that RFP out, you know, next week. We start issuing an RFP before we've had the neighborhood meeting. That's not a I think you have to have the neighborhood meeting, but I'm saying between now and our next meeting. We sit down the next meeting next month. I hope we have an RFP already planned as to what we think this is what we're going to do, how we're going to present. It. I think I think it's more of like an application process because we don't want to get into the business of having to go through the purchasing to do an RFP for every single. Okay, I, I have no idea what your procedures are. But <laughs> I just want to have a proposal, but I want to have. Whenever we market this, I want to have parameters as to what our expectations are. So we don't have somebody that says, hey, I want to put a car wash on. I'm out. That's not. I, I would recommend my personal opinion is it ought to be home or home owner occupied, not a rental. Um, if we feel like we want to be, we're trying to create very low affordable housing. I mean, there's different types of affordable housing. I think the best thing for a community is to have it owned, owner occupied. And the best thing here we could have, we have two lots that we could have owner occupied. Or you might get in my profession. Yeah. Well, you, at least you're helping two family. There are things to add. Personally, I'd rather have two residents than four seniors. That's my opinion. Okay. Mm -hmm. and so, but I think that's better for the neighborhood. And I think it will always be better. So in order to have that happen, you're going to have to talk to uh, Mennonite Housing or Habitat for Humanity. And that's the route that I would like to see us go. If we can't get anybody to do that, then I think it might be. But to me, if you really want to revitalize a neighborhood, that's the best way. I have to hear what the neighborhood. And that's it's a simple yes. process. I mean, you talk to them, what does it take to get a person in there? Do a lot contract and it's done. I don't think we've got to do all these RFPs. And if that's our main goal, which is why I'm on this board, is to help people get ownership and make that neighborhood better. And so why would we I mean unless I'm wrong, then that's how I would recommend. So but mind you, that single family build, you will not be able to build it for what it'll appraise. But but that's what you have to talk to Habitat for Humanity. They have different ways. They have people that will donate toward that. They'll have, there's different ways that can happen. And we actually fine. often are that way. Um, some of our additional programs, our home programs, help to fund some of that gap financing, some of the 80, or down payment assistance and things like that. That's where I'd like to see this head. We can spend next year doing this stuff. And I'd, I'd like to... We can make an immediate impact as we move on to the next lots. Um, it shouldn't be that hard. It's very hard. Right now, talk to our nonprofit developers that can't do it for 90,000 90, in subsidy to appraise for 95 or 100, which means they're putting 200,000 plus into it. Is that the direction? You, do you think we should be putting that much subsidy to help one family? Let's find out. Let's find out it, is that what it is? It is. Yeah, it is. Let's come up with a couple of proposals. Yes, that's exactly right. Because that we don't do this every day. We need to learn, and you guys are the ones that do it every day. So give us some direction as to what are the options. What does the community want? Well, free listing. Yeah, and, and that's where people can have the opportunity to be creative too. Because just like Jerome was saying. You can get more bang for your buck in a twin home. Well, can you promote a project that might be two twin homes on that property where one side of each one is owner occupied and rents the other, right? Is that a means to make it a little bit more affordable, have a mix of both home ownership and rental? And the very best landlords are the ones that live next door, to be honest with you, because they're right there to talk about problems. Ideally, I'd like to have grandma and grandpa live across the street, and this is a new. 
young family that exactly and that's why opening it up and, and listening to the neighborhood and and just accepting proposals that we can evaluate based on on how they're they're submitted rather than us going in and going it's single family homeowner single family owner occupied only because that's what we assume everybody wants so we have an item coming up on our council agenda i believe in early may that is a single family home bill that we're assisting with, um, we might be able to bring that as a case study for our May meeting to kind of talk through what we're seeing in some of those single family financing pictures. Send it out ahead of time, soon as it's on the agenda. Yes, we could do that. Sorry? Could you repeat those numbers that you just told me what they would have to contribute? Oh, you, I'm sorry, I'm not hearing. You spent 200,000. Yes property that you can sell for 90. Yes. That's your saying? Yes, and that's what we're hearing from our nonprofit developers right now. Well, they need to have $100,000, $110,000 of either donated material or labor. Or subsidy. We could bring the, the, the other one that's in process, too, as an example. Okay. One. So you know, as we have those, we'll send those out just because I think that's that's another side of what our department does. Um, and I think it's an important part of the picture just as we evaluate proposals, because if we decide on our end that we prefer single family homes, then on, on the back side, our department will also be probably working with some of those subsidies and allocating scarce resources in particular ways. Some of the houses that are in our target area are exactly those homes. There's also some duplex being built up there. And it'd be interesting. I don't know whether we're subsidizing those, but it'd be interesting to know what those numbers look like too. That's possible. I mean, if I gotta go knock on a door and ask a developer, I'll be glad to. I'd love to see what their thoughts are. So I can actually reach out. I'm, I'm very uh, with one of the developers that has built, I think it's like 27th or North. 29th and uh, Hillside, there's some fourplexes right there in that corner, south of 96 on the east side of the street. So, and I think there's about two, about six, maybe six to eight in that section. Uh, so it'd be interesting to learn what their process was and how they were able to. It's surprising to learn, it's, it's expensive and then it's not even comping out. So this is gonna be the challenge for us. If we're at, trying to, get all these lands or these lots, empty lots filled. Well, how are you going to fund that? That's my next question was, uh, so now we we're talking about the affordable housing fund and that process, is that still slowly progressing in terms of coming into fruition? Or is there any other gap funding sources that could be tapped into right away for allowing these de developers into this um, we just acquired. So we we typically use home funds um, to fund the subsidy for the infill development. The affordable the ARPA affordable housing fund we're still wrestling with finance and uh, treasury department because it doesn't using ARPA funds for affordable home ownership doesn't work. We we brought all of those nonprofit and for profit developers in and said help us figure out how we can make this work for home ownership under the treasury regulations and it just doesn't work. Families are upside down owing more for the property than it's worth until year 16 when, when you're using ARPA funds because uh, with the ARPA dollars, ARPA regs require every bit of it be repaid if it were to turn um, up through year 20. So that's all of the development subsidy, all of the down payment subsidy, all has to 100% of it be repaid up through year 20. And so we were working out those pro formas and the, and the mortgages and figuring out that most families are upside down until year 16. People don't stay in their homes 16 years in. Five years, right? And so, you know, we, we brought that to the developers and said, but do the affordable home ownership. And they said, yeah, we can't make this work either. Why you have to build the twin home cell block. Yeah. So that's that's what you have to do. And you sell one side of a twin home and you do that because if you go to Junction City, Manhattan, Lawrence, Kansas City, the single family houses are not around. They're they're not being built anymore. They're building row houses connected for selling off 
because there's not it's, not it's enough there's not enough land to put it on so they decided to sell just one homes basically yeah, for, for the home ownership which you just said that is selling it for you know they could buy half of it for a hundred or 120 right. and they could afford it because you'd be splitting it up between two people so whatever when i was in that meeting too and it was proposed the um trust about that scenario that just it still it still has to be repaid <laughs> that doesn't negate their that 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 subsidy that goes into the building so when you have a land trust the trust owns the land and the homeowner owns the building any money put into the building would still have to be repaid so the fact that it's in a trust, all it does is reduces the cost of the property by the value of the land. And what's the value of the land here in Wichita? Nice. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't equate to huge savings. When you're in really high cost areas, those are much more effective because you're seeing a tremendous savings by not actually buying the land itself. A lot here is you know under ten thousand dollars. It doesn't make a huge impact to. Me. The overall mortgage for a family. Be a, I yeah, think. I mean, we 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 talked about kind of minimizing. We we went like in every direction trying to figure out how to make them. Oh, sorry, in the contract for deeds, we it's that's it's and so I mean at this time we're 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 trying to reclassify some other expenditures to to change the money from ARPA funds to regular funds. But it, it's it's still something in the works. Um, we still want to see it move forward. But yeah, this has been really helpful dealing with Treasury. When you're learning all these red tape challenges that are restrictive and not helpful, it's, 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 it's the forty thousand probably not affordable housing shortage. Is there a way that they you know what what does it look like to go in and modify with it, or is it you can't modify what they have within? As, you know, it, it, it's whether it's statutory, regulatory, anything that you're going to go back to anything that's statutory is going to take years to change. So, for example, one of our, our hurdles in the disposition of the public housing units has to do with all the environmental requirements. Well, they're already having discussions about eliminating that that provision in the cases of disposition, they expect it's going to be three years before they could implement that change. And we're like, we're not, we can't wait three years. We're going to have to just still get through the process. So it's, it's not a lot of fun. <laughs> so are we still trying to look, focus on both lanes here? Okay, that's good. Because, yeah. gosh. Yeah, and we're trying to still figure out a mechanism to make home insurance work. Because we do see the value in home ownership, but it's just going to probably look different than what was originally available. I did want to share, I've got our administrative policies up here, um, so I can share a little bit about what a future transfer procedure would look like for disposition of the property. Um, basically, and this is also for anyone who may be watching online or watches at a future point, um, we would need a project description, a description of the development team, development team, including developer, co-developer, owner, general contractor, consultant, architect, project manager, lead construction manager, marketing agent, and project management post-construction. We would need a market information plan, project financing information, a development budget. Um, if it's going to be a rental transaction, we need an operating budget, in yeah. documentation, and then evidence of compliance with all policies. And so those are the broad strokes, what we would be looking for in future disposition proposals. Possibly can share that out. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm like I can't catch up. I yes, I know that was that was the flyby, and I'm glad to send that out. And then probably at this point, we also put that on our website and begin kind of getting things out there. And then hopefully in May, come with a more refined plan. Um, the other thing through April and May is that we do have some community engagement opportunities. And so I'll send those dates out to each board member. If you could let me know which ones, if you plan to attend, if you would like to attend. Um, that way we can ensure that we cap it at three per activity so we don't have to notice of open meetings. Um, but that, those are probably the next steps. And I'm sorry I didn't come better prepared with those in mind. But, you know, I think there's that walk up to the celebration and then remember the work, the work continues and we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, even 
Any other questions? If not, I move we uh, close the meeting. In a second. Thank you. Alex. All in favor say aye. Same side. Thank you very much, staff. Thank you. And a quick note our meeting will be one week later next month. That was based on availability of this meeting room. And so I'll send some extra notices with that in mind.